memories, and I, I just have to say a couple words about it. And I did, I, I was wounded bad enough that they shipped me off the island to Guam. I had surgery there, surgery on the Okinawa, surgery on Guam. And they still needed more, so they shipped me back to Hawaii. And I finally got enough doctors and equipment there that took it all out of my back as much as they could get. And I got better, and I lived a good life. But, you know, maybe I'm, I'm so proud of you. It's so good to hear you. <laughs> I'm reading a book, and it's all about Okinawa and the 96th Infantry Division, and I'll read it, and I will come back and, and, uh, and think about what you have said. But anyway, that's just a few words I wanted to say. And, and uh, uh, well, I'm glad I'm here. 87 years now I've lived, and I'm glad that I, I made it back. A lot of good friends. And many, 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 as Dick says, many, many friends of mine. I can name them forever. It's just, you know, well, anyway, when you, there's, there's probably dozens of you guys that have been combat, someplace in the war, someplace around. I see over here, there's Garrett Goldman. Oh, all the things he could tell stories about, the things that happened to him, and uh, many of you others, but this is just one of the little stories, and, and uh, I'm proud of you was in the Army, and I'm proud I got home, I married a great gal, had a great family, <laughs> I'm not going to talk anymore, because I'm going to start thinking about these guys again. One fella, one more, I just want to say, one fella lived in Wisconsin. We were on the ship rail, going to Okinawa. We were on the sea runner. And he come up to me, he was married, twin daughters. I gave them. So we took pictures. He says, Woody, that's Woody. You know, when your name is Woody, you're always you're Woody. Well, he says, Woody, I'm not going, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make, I says, Sid. He was from another state. He was Sid Waterman. I said, Sid, you are. He had ready share, good looking man, about 25, 24. Well, we got on the island. He went to another company next to mine. I was in G Company, 383rd, and he was company next to me, and he was killed. I heard about it later. He lived up in northern Wisconsin, and I I didn't get, I didn't know when he was going to be home, or I would have gone up there. I didn't, I didn't know, but I got some paperwork, I got some stuff from the funeral. And boy, I tell you, that tore me up <laughs> to read about him and get, you know. He was right. But this is, this is just a thing. So I'm just thinking, no, I, I, I said too much, you know. I mean, it's just, before I start crying like a baby, I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> Here this evening is a person that we deeply respect. Kurt and I have this wonderful department chair. Her name is Kathy Tosa. <laughs> Kathy has a personal story to share about her mother, who was a German civilian in oh, Berlin. You weren't supposed to give that away. It was going to be a surprise. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's OK. <laughs> All right, now let's see. This is forward, I suppose. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to tell you just a little bit of a different perspective. Um, it's always wonderful to hear about the, the soldiers that fight and, and are out there and, and are defending their countries, um, both from uh, of both sides of, of the battle, actually. Uh, but they're always in the total war and the war, type of warfare that we now engage in, there's always a civilian side as well. And so I wanted to share um, the side from the perspective of the German civilian. Now let me see if this works. Aha! Yes, there she is, and, and George let the cat out of the bag. This is my mother. This is Margot. Um, when the war started in Germany in 1939, uh, my mom was 15 years old. So younger than most of you here. Um, she um, says she remembers 
hearing that the war had begun. She came home uh, and it had been announced on the radio and um, that was the beginning of everything. She lived, she lived in Heidelberg um, and uh, this is the, what the German country looked like at the beginning of the war here and that's where Heidelberg is located. You maybe heard of Heidelberg, beautiful university town with a long history um, and that's where my mother was living. Um, as, the, as the years went on, she uh, obviously, a 15-year-old, she's growing a little older, um, she had finished with elementary school and she went, into, um, uh, went to a language school, a Vorbeckschule in Mannheim, which was nearby, and that was a school uh, that specifically trained translators. Um, they could study French, which my mother thought was wonderful, um, she didn't really like English very well, but she had to study and learn some English. Uh, and they did a little Spanish also. And so she thought that was interesting and, and that she would um, study a little bit of language and didn't know exactly what she'd do with it, but and, uh, that was what she was working toward. Um, every day she would get up and ride the Oige, that was the name of the streetcar, that connected Heidelberg and Mannheim. Um, and it actually ran parallel uh, to the very first stretch of Autobahn. The Autobahn is the big superhighway system um, that's in Germany, and the very first stretch of it went from Heidelberg to Mannheim. But my mother didn't have a car, and uh, she rode the streetcar, and uh, for two years um, she studied there at the school, learned her verbs, put the adjective endings on it, all those kinds of things that you have to learn, um, and did things that she could do as a, a young teenager in Germany. In 1941, uh, she and her mother moved to Mannheim um, early in that year, um, and it was a, uh, Mannheim is a, a, a beautiful Baroque uh, palace there in Mannheim. Um, this was the, goes back historically, the Count of the Palatinate, a very powerful uh, guy in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, lived here in Mannheim, built a palace, had a beautiful water tower. It was a gorgeous city. Mannheim was beautiful. Um, it also, though, was an industrial center. And in 1941, uh, that doesn't bode well for any German city because that makes them then a target. Um, not only uh, was Mannheim a bond, uh, the industrial uh, center of Mannheim, but it was also the first time that the uh, bombing was a deliberate terror type bombing because not only did the bombers drop bombs on the, the targets, the military targets, but they also started bombing the city center um, and actually uh, pretty much obliterated uh, the center of Mannheim. This was the first time um, that this kind of terror bombing had been used um, and um, it did produce terror. Um, my mother recalls that this was sort of the first time that she had experienced being bombed. Um, the officials near where she lived uh, had built a bunker. They lived by the tennis courts. And there was an above ground bunker, a high bunker they called it. Um, and so when the sirens went off, um, you ran to the nearest bunker and then you waited. It was still kind of new to my mom at this point in time. And not an every night occurrence yet, uh, but when you came out of the bunker then, and certainly in the morning, um, you saw whose house had survived and whose hadn't, and you saw the results of the bombing. From December 1940 already, that's when this terror bombing started, to March of 45, there were more than 150 attacks by either the RAF or by the United States Air Force. Um, on Mannheim. Um, this intense bombing, this terror bombing, um, was, um, was something that was new, uh, that had been, up until this point, uh, it, the bombing had always been very targeted on the industrial centers, uh, but no more. My mom said, um, as she was recalling this, 
Uh, well, we, we really didn't know a lot what was going on. At this point in the war, there, weren't, there was no television. Um, there were no newspapers being published. There was just the radio. And so um, you pretty much heard what the government told you. Um, and at this point, they were still being told, oh, they were winning. They were the sea guts. You know, that, that things were going really well for the Germans yet. And so that's, you believed what, you were, what your government told you, and so you went on about your life as best you can, which I'm sure is what people did in the United States as well. My mother studied. She, um, in the springtime of 1942, sat for her exam and became a certified translator. By now, she was about 18 years old. Her birthday's in January, so she turned 18. Um, and she mastered all of those languages um, and was certified. And so, um, she also had girlfriends, and one of her friends, Irmgard, um, had graduated the year before her and had a job in Berlin. Um, and there was another job available, and so my mother, thought, well, that would be something that she could do. So she went to work for the Auswärtige Amt, uh, which is a listening post. Uh, they listen to French and British broadcasts. Um, they transcribe them. And then uh, those were the more skilled and more uh, practiced translators. And then my mom um, got to do the translations. So they analyzed the content and they attempted to glean information that would be helpful to their government and their war effort. Now, this is, you know, they, they put the headphones on and they listened and uh, the various radio, whoops, various radio reports um, were, were uh, written down and, and um, huh, I, they worked hard. There were about 25 of them. Um, they worked night and day in shifts. And they were located at the Say House um, on Wannsee, which is near Berlin. Um, you might recall from your history that Potsdam is also uh, on Wannsee. And that's where, of course, at the end of the war, um, the Allies will meet and divide up Germany. So in that same neighborhood. Um, Irmgard had a, a job there, my mom had a job there as well, um, and she would ride back and forth from Berlin out to Wannsee on the public transportation. Um, here we are going from Heidelberg um, up to Berlin. Uh, probably, oh, nowadays it would take you maybe five, six hours, something like that, uh, to make this journey.